Okay. Um, in order to apply for a patent for your Flesh Protect drug, um, first of all, it has to be patentable material, which changes country to country, and also it has to be an invention. Um, from there, it has to be novel. It can't be something that already exists or that everybody just does and thinks about already. And it has to be non-obvious, which means that if, there's some, <coughs> a, if your drug is already really similar to something else that's exactly on the market, so someone could make it without having any er obvious thought. It has to be useful, which means that it has to have a use. Like in this case, your flesh protect drug should actually work on treating this flesh eating enzyme. And, oh, and um, it, you have to have enablement, which means that you need to have a really clear written description of how you make it so that once your patent is up in 20 <coughs> years, that it's open for the scientific community or anyone who wants to maybe improve on it or make it themselves. Challenge. Oh, wait, there's more. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so you need to protect your Flesh Protect name, so you do that by applying for a trademark, which you have to <coughs> renew every 10 years, and you can't go three years without using it, and you can't have it be the same name as something else in the same field or something that's super well-known, like Microsoft. And the constitutional and legal issues involved, um, patents are only mentioned once in the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 8.8. .8. And um, it's, they talk about it in order to promote scientific inventions and art and um, so that people can actually make money. And legal issues are just that you need to get a patent. They're country specific. So if you want to use it in a lot of different countries, you should apply for that and to make Challenge. sure that you're the first one. Challenge group up in Davis. Hi. Um, you, earlier you said um, you can anneal the gene into the vector or uh, anneal with ligase. Can you tell me the difference between annealing and ligating? Mm -hmm. Good question. So annealing is forming hydrogen bonds and ligating is forming phosphodiester bonds. Next challenge. What, is, what are the pros <coughs> and cons of a genomic library versus a cDNA library? <clears throat> okay, so for cDNA libraries, um, it's f easier to work with because you can, if you know where the protein is generated in the body, then you just go to that body part and isolate the mRNA so you don't have to like look at the entire genome and th that takes too much time and it's inefficient. Challenge. Um, can you elaborate how probes work? Probes. How does a probe detect a gene? Right. Or how you choose a probe. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it how the probe works or how do you choose the probe? Those are two different questions. Uh, how you choose the probe. Like what probe you use. Okay. Well, in this case, we're making a probe um, because we want to identify the gene. So we first found the enzyme that was secreted and um, then went backwards, and it's a degenerative code, but for making the probe, you'd want to use part of the sequence that's the least degenerative. Um, and, wait, that's how you find, yeah. chose it. Yeah, so <coughs> because it's degenerative, and you, but you're still choosing the least degenerative part of the gene, but you still have to make multiple probes just in case, so you would, use that. You, then you obtain the sequence of that, that creates that protein and then you use that to probe after you label it. Challenge question. Um, could, could you use gene therapy in any way for, um, for, crea for the, hold on. Um, could you use gene therapy in any way to do this, yes yeah. or no? There we go, that's the question. Yes. And what exactly? How could you use gene therapy? Yeah, yeah. there we go. 
Well, unfortunately with this disease, you die within 24 hours. So you would have to have lightning fast gene therapy um, to help fix it. But if you did, if you detected it like instantly, you could then take, it targets the skin cells, yeah. So you could take skin cells out of the patient and then um, through using like a viral vector or something, insert a gene that would stop the flesh eating bacteria and then put those, those healthy cells or the cells with your helper gene back into the patient and hopefully it would kill enough of it so they wouldn't die. Challenge question. Mm -hmm. uh, along the lines of gene therapy, when, when, or when do you use it? Or like with what type of diseases? Let's stick this to this one. particular question. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> Any more questions for this question? I'm done. <laughs> What's the properties of the genetic code, Taylor? And how does that impact this particular question? Um... Uh, properties of genetic code. Mm -hmm. What does the properties of the genetic code have to do with this question? And how this group answered this question? I don't know. <laughs> Lauren? Well, the genetic code, like they said, the genetic code is degenerate. What does so that mean? It means that... Um, Basically, it's like there's different, you can have different combinations of genes. And so like they said, there's different like, combinations or not, of genes. Not genes, I'm sorry, nucleotides. And so like, especially like in, in terms different of amino Different combinations of nucleotides for what? That code for a specific amino acid. Mm -hmm. And so, and in this case, like a lot of times you can have an amino acid that can have four different codons or something mm -hmm. like that. So how does that impact the design of their experiment? Okay, so when they're sequencing the enzyme, they're obviously going to have to look at the individual amino acids and all the different codes that code for each amino acid and obviously there's going to be amino acids in the protein that probably have yeah. more than one codon yeah. so you'd have to do the least degenerate region. Can you tell me all the different properties of a vector that you would use for genetic engineering? Samantha? Um. Properties of any vector could be a plasmid, could be a virus. What are the major properties of a vector? Um, the whole basis of genetic engineering. Properties of a vector? Mm -hmm. It has to be able to penetrate the cell in some way or be able to survive inside the cell that we're injecting it to. Mm -hmm. um, Marvin, what are the properties of any vector that these, these, this group said that they use this vector. What are the properties of any vector used for genetic engineering? Uh, a vector should be able to hold foreign DNA. Good. So to be able to insert DNA into it, that's one. What else? Um, and, be able to, and the vector should be able to insert that foreign DNA into the, the genome mean insert? Of, or transform another cell using that vector. You mean the vector should be able to get in and out of a cell? Yeah. Okay, what is another property? I mean, it's the whole basis of this entire class. All the things that we talked about for 10 weeks would never be possible without these properties. Stephen? And then I'll come back to you guys. Um, another one is that there has to be a way that you can select. Yeah, for, selectable marker. Yeah, selectable marker. What else, Stephen? Julie? The vector's got to be able to replicate the DNA. Yeah, replicate, get it in and out of the cell easily, be able to insert into, you know, be able to get foreign DNA inserted into it and have some selectable marker. Excellent. Back to, back to this particular group. Um, 
tell me all the properties of the genetic code. Since you had to use the genetic code to do this wonderful cloning and identification of the gene. Your answer? It's universal. What else? It can express a phenotype. The code? Or What's the, that's implicit. No. What are the properties of the code? Um, the codes for amino acids. It what? Complementary base pairs. No, I don't think so. I think you better think that out. <laughs> I don't think the genetic code has any complementary base pairs. It's stable. The genetic code is stable? I don't I think, what are the specific properties of the genetic code? Degeneracy was one. What are some of the other major properties? Universals, two. What else? Eric? Um, I was just saying it accommodates mutations. Well, that's not a property of the genetic well, okay. code. That it can gets, be a property of anything. It's inherited. That's a property of DNA is the genetic material. Oh, okay. What's the properties of the genetic code? Derek? Mora? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Three nucleotides. Ah, something you forgot just a little bit here. Three nucleotides per codon. Okay. Um, one final question. You're trying to make this... Uh, drug, um, this molecular drug, and you said that you were going to use some salve. You didn't say that, but it was sort of implicit that you're going to put it in some cream that you can rub on your skin, and that cream's going to contain some antisense probe of some kind. Is that correct? That's sort of the gist of, of, of your drug? Well, let's just say that you want to make a drug, but you can't make any antisense. Because in order to use antisense, you'd be infringing on someone else's patent. So you're not allowed to use antisense in making your drug. What would be another strategy that you could use that has nothing to do with nucleic acids? Yeah, Answer? Um, could you use like a restriction enzyme to target the in a salve? In a salve? How are you going to make that specific? I mean, you could use specific antibodies. Let's say that you, what did you say? Specific antibodies. To what? To the, um, to the flesh-eating enzyme. Yeah, so you could use antibodies, just like in cancer therapy. Great job. Thank you very, very, very much. <laughs> Wonderful. OK. Let's continue this theme here because I like it. And let's go to question number four. Question number four is going to be answer group number C and challenge group number A. The clock is now running. Okay. Um, for the metabolic disorder, it's due to nuclear it's due nuclear. Um, it's shown because if it were mitochondrial, this mother would have to pass it on through all three children because mitochondrial DNA is passed down from only your mother. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. What am I doing? Um, it is. It is recessive because if it was dominant. If it's dominant, or if it were dominant, which it's not, um, these parents right here in generation one would be homozygous recessive, which means that their children could not have the disease. And it is autosomal. It is not sex-linked because since the mother in generation one has it, um, her sons would have it because the, the, she would pass on the bad allele and it wouldn't be masked because they would have the in the X chromosome and it wouldn't be masked because they have a Y chromosome too. 
Um, the genotypes of the two individuals in figure one are both heterozygous, so we chose to use like letter Can A. Can you just talk in and straight and talk to the class? Um, big A and little a for both parents. And the genotypes of the embryos tested in figure two. Um, for cell one, it would be um, homo homozygous for um, little a. Cell two would be homozygous for big A. Cell three, homozygous for little a. Cell four would be heterozygous, big A, little a. Cell five would be homozygous, big A. And cell six would be homozygous, little a. Okay, and then I forgot another reason why it's not sex linked is it's not on the Y chromosome either because father, the father in generation two um, would pass it on to all of his sons. And then um, I, if you implanted the cells into the mother, you would pick cells two and five because they are healthy and they're also not carriers, which cell four is. And the, the genetic and biochemical basis for the, this disease, we're assuming that it's an inborn error of metabolism of purines, which means that there's an enzyme that's not functioning properly, and the enzyme isn't, it's not functioning properly to break down the purines, and it's not functioning properly because it's misshaped, because enzymes are shape-specific, and it's misshaped because the amino acid sequence that was used <coughs> to make it up is incorrect and um, it's folding in an incorrect way. And the reason that the amino acid sequence is incorrect is because the mRNA sequence used to make the amino acid sequence is incorrect. And the mRNA sequence is incorrect because the genetic sequence used to make the mRNA sequence is incorrect. It's the, the, uh, the core dogma of genetics, the, the gene to the mRNA to the protein. Okay. So um, the next part is about ASO DNA testing, and so that's what we did when we tested all the different embryos. That's what it was. It was PGS. Um, and anyway, the ASOs. So an ASO is an allele-specific oligonucleotide, and it's um, like a specific sequence of about 20 nucleotides, and it's the sequence is specific for a very specific allele, and it will only bond to a sequence if the match is like is perfect, which is why it's used, because then you can use them for specific allele sequences and then you can test and see and know the genotype of like an embryo or something like that. Uh, yeah. okay. So part D, uh, we have the enzyme so we can use uh, reverse translation. That's not a biological process. We use the genetic code as a basis to make, to generate some uh, I think some mRNA probes. Uh, the code is degenerate, so we could pick an area where it is less degenerate to uh, make, so we have to try out less probes. Uh, we will use these probes on, on the genomic library to screen for the part of the gene and uh, then we would generate m more probes from that fragment that we detected and walk the sequence <coughs> to find the whole sequence of the gene. And to detect the mutant uh, gene sequence, we will make another genomic library. Uh, from a hetero, no, a homozygous individual. And we will use pretty much the same uh, sequence walking methods as we did in the, in the normal <coughs> genomic library. And then we would sequence these two genes and compare them to detect the uh, uh, mutation that gave rise to this uh, disease. Is that it? Challenge! How do you do in vitro fertilization? Oh. 
Um, you extract an egg cell or uh, multiple egg cells from a f the female donor and you extract, um, well, you get sperm from a male donor. Um, <laughs> and you, um, you combine these in culture and then you take the embryos that result and implant them into the uterus. Okay, so you said that um, <coughs> metabolic uh, defect could be uh, due to some error within the, the, the gene itself, right? Is it possible um, to have a metabolic defect um, with like a SNP or something outside of the, of the genetic material? <laughs> well, I mean, if it was in an intron, it wouldn't matter, but say it was in a promoter or an activator, then yes, you could have some kind of wrongful expression of the gene that could result in a problem. Challenge. Uh, I think Derek said that you have to make a second cDNA, I mean, a DNA li or genomic library for the diseased person. Do you, what, do you have to make the DNA library? No, we could use PCR using uh, certain probes on, let's say, the edges of the, uh, of the gene and amplify it that way. Challenge. Could I ask you to walk me through that uh, figure two, please? Is it anyone? Just go through it quickly. Do you mean the ASO procedure? Yes, please. So after... Derek, you the only after, one in this group? After... Okay, anyway, so basically in the first one, um, as you can see, they're extracting, that's actually, I'm pretty sure, that's the eggs, and so you're extracting an egg. It's a pointer on the, on, oh, sorry. Yeah. So right there, you're extracting an egg from, you know, the ovary, and then those eggs are going into a culture dish, and then you're going to expose them to um, sperm that you're going to use to fertilize the eggs, and so then those are the embryos. They're actually eight, um, eight cell embryos, so three days, and then in the last one, they're extracting um, a cell for um, PGS, so pre-implantation genetic screening, to test for um, the genetic disease that we're dealing with in this family. Challenge. Is that cell differentiated, the one they're extracting? Mm, no. no, it's a stem it's cell. A, it's a moral. To stem cell? Oh, just kidding. To stem cell? No. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. Challenge. Can you walk me through a uh, chromosome walking? <laughs> or describe chromosome walking? <laughs> okay. Um, well, you would have a probe, right? Probe. Yeah. You would have a probe for a super certain sequence, and for each, you would get it, and then it would match, and then part of that would go for the next one, and then so on and so forth until you have one The sequence you find, the first one, you would use it as like the new probe, and then you'd get the next sequence to get a larger part, and then that'd be a probe, right? And the key to chromosome walking, too, is the partial digestion of the <coughs> genomes that you have overlapping fragments to begin with. Any more challenges? So in this particular case, you implanted cell 2 and 5 into the mother. So what are you going to do with cell 1, 3, and 6? And what are the ethical and <laughs> issues <laughs> around that? You mean what are they going to do with cell 1, 3, and 6 after they've used it for PCR? The cell? No, like the, your leftover embryos. Thank you. Well, isn't this like opinion based? Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, so those cells, since um, they're for the parents, they would be frozen in case the parents wanted to, say, have another child or something like that. That would be probably the main purpose. Um, and if I so that's the initial purpose of well, that. Well, what are the issues with respect to these embryos? What are they going to do with them? What are the legal aspects? What did the parents have to do? What did they have to sign? What did they have to consent to? All of the different things that we had discussed in the class relative to the in vitro fertilization. 
Um, well, there's a we lot went of over it in a lot of detail. There's a lot of implications when you're talking about leftover cells. Um, and depending on what state you're in, there's So what are the options that the parents have? They could either discard them, they could freeze them. Um, and store them? They could store, yeah, freeze or, and store. Or donate for research. Or donate them to research. Or, or, or make a, a new child out of them. They're going to make a new child out of them? Or destroy them, donate them from research? What? Can they also possibly give them up for like another couple? Give them up for yeah. adoption. And what's the frequency with which those choices are exercised by the parents of those embryos? Which one is the one that's most common? Um, discarding is most common. Freezing, freezing is usually freezing. most common. Freezing, exactly. OK, um, could you please describe the principle of ASO as it relates to the properties of the DNA double helix? Oh, okay, so the ASO, like I said, it's a very small sequence of nucleotides. In the context of the double helix. Right, and so it, it's so that it would be complementary to a specific sequence on in the DNA that codes for a specific the specific gene that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But how does the ASO work to distinguish between one form of the allele and another form of the allele when they only differ by one nucleotide? They're specific for a very, very specific sequence, and they will only bind if the sequence is exactly correct. In the context of the double helical structure of DNA, how come they'll only bind if the sequence is perfect? Uh, the double helix will not form uh, given the, uh, the conditions and the... So how do you distinguish between the probe that won't bind to its mismatched partner and the probe that will bind to its identical partner. What are those conditions relative to the helic, double helical structure? Uh, so it would, not com it would not form hydrogen bonds if it's not. Under what conditions? Uh, maybe like kind of higher heat. Higher temperature? Higher temperature. Great. Okay, terrific. Um, Let's just say that uh, you're doing this procedure and uh, you're thinking about all the different possibilities uh, and you're starting from scratch and you really don't know anything about a lot of different stuff. So how do you make your genome library? What are the vectors? What's the DNA? How do you go about doing it? What exactly is the method by which you go about making this genome library group? In about one minute. Yeah. So we would use uh, restriction enzymes and. What's your vector? Oh yeah, we. Is Derek the only one in this group? Is Michelle in this group? So what's the vector? Virus. Pardon? Virus. What's the vector? Virus. Michelle, what's the vector? Huh? Viruses. What virus? Retrovirus? Are you going to use the retrovirus, Michelle, for a vector to make your human genome library? Bacteriophage for a Okay, tell me what a bacteriophage is and how it replicates. So, Can you like, stand up, please, instead of leaning on the board? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, the lytic cycle where it's like it will attach to mm -hmm. the... What's the structure of the bacteriophage? What does it look like? Can you draw a picture? <laughs> we know Stephen loves them. <laughs> and what type of bacteriophage are we using? T2, T6, T4, T5... What's the name of the bacteriophage? Lambda. Yeah, and what's the neat property of the genome? What's, tell me about the property of the lambda genome. Tell me about the property of the lambda genome that lends itself to being a vector, Albert. 
Tell me about the properties of the lambda genome that lends itself to being a vector. It's single-stranded. The genome of the lambda virus is single-stranded. No. Is it a DNA or an RNA genome? It's an RNA genome. Okay. Do you agree with that, Brian? The lambda virus genome that we used for making libraries of human DNA it has an RNA genome. Do you agree with that? What's the kind of genome is in that virus? I can't hear you. A DNA. Yeah. And what are the properties of that genome that allows it to be a really wonderful vector, a wonderful vector for cloning uh, human DNA or any other DNA? It has a left and a right arm, and then... Great. And what's on the left and the right arm? What it, kind of genes? Genes to make the virus. And, what, and the what's proteins. in the middle? In the middle is the actually coding sequence, so you can put your foreign gene Coding in. sequence for, for the virus? No, for the... What's in the middle of the viral genome? DNA. And is it dispensable? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, I have one more question for this particular group. You said that the, uh, if we go back to this beautiful pedigree up there, you said that the was an autosome. It was uh, a nuclear autosome in the nucleus, not mitochondrial. You said that it was uh, recessive, am I correct? You said that it wasn't sex-linked, and you said that the genotypes of the parents were big A, little a, or big B, little b. Correct? Would you have been able to know the genotypes of those parents without knowing from your molecular analyses the genotypes of the offspring? Um, you would have been able to know... For Can you the use the pointer? Um, you would have been able to know for the father but not for the mother. Are you sure? Or, is it the other way around? Actually, you would have probably been able to at least assume because, see, this, these two parents here that don't exhibit the disease at all were able to produce people that have the disease, so obviously there has so to be So what are the, if you don't know the genotypes of the offspring from figure two, mm -hmm. what are the possible genotypes of the parents? Okay. Do you want to go? So this person could either be, could be heterozygous. Or? Or homozygous. Exactly. And the other person? Heterozygous or homozygous. Exactly. So you wouldn't know unless you had the results of the offspring. Is that correct? Yeah. Good. Okay. Wouldn't you know that the dad has to be heterozygous because his father, his father is homozygous recessive? Are you sure about that? Well, if it's a recessive? Yes. Absolutely positive. Gene? Yes. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hold it. Eden, put your hand down. Okay, we're, we're done here. Any other questions? Let's give a big hand to this group. It's way over time. Okay. Hold on. We have three questions to go. So we're going to take a five-minute break. And Ingrid told me Great. Faria, are you having fun? I'm having a party. <laughs> Heard you guys had some Thai food the other night. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. That's great. Okay, Kate, are you ready? Is everyone ready? I think we have uh, one more question to go, right? Okay, let's do... Keeping with the same uh, theme here, let's do question number seven. <laughs> question number seven is group number B and challenge group number E. Hold it. Mike, go ahead. Just want to have you guys calm down. Chris, put it away. Thank you. 
Okay, so part A, the major crops that have been genetically engineered. There is maize, cotton, soybean, canola, and rice. <coughs> For the traits that have been genetically engineered into these crops, there's insect resistance, herbicide tolerance, combinations of those two, and then enhanced nutritional value. And then for the countries that grow genetically engineered crops, the US, Brazil, Argentina, Canada, and then others, but those are the, the main growers. Uh, cool, so part B, uh, what regulatory processes would you have to go through in the US in order to release a genetically engineered crop? There's three government agencies you need to go through. The first is the EPA, in which case you need to prove that it is environmentally safe and fit for you know, environmental consumption. Uh, the second part is through the FDA, where you have to prove that it is safe to eat and that there would be no adverse effects on either people or crops eating the plants. And the third one is going to be the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. And there you, that's just generally, you're going to have to prove that it's you know, overall good. Uh, there's a few processes that you have to go through. You have to prove, first of all, that it's conceptually going to be safe, and that's just a lot of paperwork. You have to prove that the idea behind it wouldn't harm an individual. After that, you have to prove it in an isolated small farm. You have to pr just grow it and then go through extensive testing to show that those crops are going to be safe. Uh, after that, you can th grow it on some small farms that go through specific processes that make sure that it doesn't spread to the uh, general environment. And after that, it's just going to be uh, fit for general consumption. And I believe the term is grass. Uh, generally regarded as safe, and that's going to be the general term you're going to need in order to do so. Um, and you do have to go through a lot more of the uh, paperwork and processes if, than you would for conventional breeding, and that's mostly because of public fears and the possibilities of something going wrong in the genetic process. Um, reasons that uh, anti-GMO groups give for not wanting to grow genetically engineered crops include uh, inadvertent environmental like damage. Um, for example, um, one issue that's pretty large or significant is the fear of superweeds. That is, if you genetically engineer a plant to have certain, say, herbicide or pesticide resistance that, um, is, that closely resembles genetically at least another, a certain kind of weed, they're in the same kind of genetic family, they can interbreed. Um, the fear is that the, the recombinant pollen from a, a transgenic plant could um, find its way to a weed and you know breed with it and create a sort of super weed that can survive in conditions that it normally cannot survive in. Um, and there's also uh, maybe in, in regards to environmental factors, there's also um, inadvertent the fear of inadvertent effects on unintended targets such as for example there's a uh, bt resistant or a uh, bt plants that are kind of like pesticide resistant and um I f for example like monarch butterflies that are not you know really pests die from the bt re uh, bt plants um another reason that anti-GMO groups give for not wanting to grow genetically engineered crops is the fact that these genetic technologies will benefit only the large scale kind of operations. Um, they, won't, they won't really benefit smaller farmers as much. Um, also, they also fear uh, inadvertent, like kind of like health risks to, to you know, eating transgenic plants. Um, their argument is that, you know, you don't really know all the effects. It's kind of unpredictable what um, genetic engineering might do to certain crops. Um, and there's also another um, reason that they give for against genetically engineered crops is re resistance development. You know, pests may develop re uh, resistance to certain um, transgenic plants, and that would make them harder to deal with. Um, so for Part D, um, number one, the advantages include uh, um, precision, so you know what you're trying to engineer for. Um, also, the speed of it, it's much faster than uh, classical breeding. Also, you, you can cross the species barrier, so you don't have to worry about only breeding in between the, se the same species. And you can also work with genes that don't exist in nature, so um, 
yeah, you can use those genes. Um, yeah. Oh, also, we can work with uh, genes that aren't expressed. Um, naturally, with normal breeding, we can only work with genes that we know from the phenotype. All right. Um, concept. Oh, oh, not done yet. One more. Um, <laughs> two and three. Okay. Um, the reason why their views are anti scientific is um, well, first of all, they inhibit scientific progress. Uh, also, because, um, also because they def they're trying to define what's a natural process when, in fact, we're also, um, genetic engineering is using natural processes, which leads to part three. Uh, because we're basically doing the central dogma thing from DNA to mRNA to proteins, and we're using that same genetic process. It's ju the only difference would be that we're inserting like a different gene genetic sequence into it or combining different species. Um, also, to elaborate on number two, um, the anti-GMO groups don't really offer an alternative to addressing global issues of, you know, uh, like not enough food. And also, oh, okay. Um, I guess it's my turn now. Um, so, conceptually, how we would use the cloned um, G, the cloned soybean, which is um, resistant to Phytophora, um, using classical breeding. Um, what we would want to do is we want to would want to clo or excuse me, breed our um, resistant plant with a regular strain non-resistant plant, then what you can do is you can take the seeds and because we have the sequencing technology that we have now, you can sequence the seeds to see if they are resistant to the fungi. Though, if you don't have that technology, if for some reason these anti-GMO groups are like, no, you can't sequence, um, you can also <laughs> grow your plants and see, you know, expose them to the fungus and see if they are resistant um, to the fungus, because if they're not, they'll die. Um, <laughs> so then what you can do is either way, if you're either sequencing or exposing the fungus to these plants, you can then go on to the next generation, you know, breed again until you get to a homozygous, um, homozygous resistant plant. Challenge. If you sequence the seeds, aren't you destroying the plant that you've wanted to create? Well, what we can do is, instead of just sequencing the seeds, I mean, if you sequence the seeds, you'll find out what it is, yeah, but you will exactly be destroying the <laughs> what you'd be creating. But what you can do is, like you would do if you exposed the fungus to the plants, you would grow the seeds, and then you would take, like, a leaf or something, you know, some sort of tissue from the plant and um, test it that way. Good catch. <laughs> Challenge. How would you respond to somebody who said that they only shop at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's because they don't like genetically modified foods? <coughs> Someone? Go. Everybody. Uh, I would ask, like, look up your facts. Why? Challenge. You mentioned that herbicide, res herbicide resistance is one of the traits engineered in these crops. For example, with BT herbicide resistance, or, sorry, for example, with the BT bug, what exactly, how is this herbicide resistance? Can you say that again, Julie? That was a little confusing. Okay, you mentioned that, you mentioned BT resistance. Can you explain how a plant would express BT resistance? Um, through, through genetic engineering and fun stuff like that, we would be able to genetically engineer cert so that certain proteins are created in the uh, cell walls of a normal plant uh, that allows them to create a sort of like critical failure in the way that the bug when bugs that eat it sort of get like a diarrhea buildup sort of thing. So con I think deadly constipation was what you described in class. But no, I said so a massive case of indigestion. Okay, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> Digestion issues. I don't know if a uh, little, I don't know if a worm gets constipated. But <laughs> you can do that experiment. Challenge. Do you believe that GMO products should be labeled as such? Um, I, I do not. I think they go through the same regulatory process through the FDA, the USDA, EPA. 
as any other product, so they shouldn't have to be labeled. Challenge? Uh, one of the concerns about, or the anti-GMO groups have is that um, a plant will transfer its DNA through mating to another type of plant. Is there a way that you can prevent a plant from passing on its genes? Well, what you can do is you can make sure that you say you're doing some, like you have, say, a genetically modified barley. You don't want to grow this genetically modified barley where there's wild barley because then you would have the danger of cross-pollination and you'd have the danger of having super weeds or some sort of like, you know, un you can't do anything about it. Uh, I kind um, of, in more context yeah. that you couldn't pass it on to a different generation even within the same species. Um, so one way to do it. Restate your question very specifically. Um, is there a way to keep a plant from passing on its genes to its next generation? Um, you could confine the genetic engineering or the addition of the BT gene, say, for example, to cells that are not passed on to non-sex uh, genes or somatic cells of the plant. There's also um, in plants, you also, plants have a set of DNA also in um, where their cytoplasm, or not cytoplasm, their, um, what is the word? Correction, chloroplast. Chloroplast, DNA. that's it. That, that starts with a C. Um, so there's another, they have another set of genes in their chloroplast. And so um, if you modify those genes, um, as far as I understand, they don't pass on. Question, challenge. What is totipotency and how is it helpful? Um, okay, so totipotency is the ability of, um, ability of something for it, to be, for it to be able to grow from one section into an entire um, <coughs> organism. So it's helpful in the case of our experiment because you can take like one piece of a plant and have it grow into the entire plant. Uh, your, the most important part of this question was outlined conceptually how you would use your cloned uh, phytophthora resistant gene in order to uh, do a breeding program in order to get this into sensitive varieties. Mm -hmm. And you gave uh, two ways. One, you're going to sequence the seeds. I don't know. That, yeah, what I, we, we, we modified that. Sorry about that one. We're going to, you have to grow the seeds and then sequence the. DNA of the plants. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that you're going to start spreading the fungus <laughs> into the environment, right? Well, I think it was more that we would test before we continue to breed, mm -hmm. like within our control group, mm -hmm. we would um, sort of expose it to it in a very mm -hmm. limited, very safe way. Okay. I don't know if you can actually expose yeah. a fungus to now, a sensitive strain safely. I, I think that that's all fine and good. <laughs> now, let's throw those two down the drain because they're not going to work. And let's come up with the real experiment of how this is done. You have no sequencing ability. You have no sequencing machines. And you don't have a culture of this fungus. So now tell me exactly how you're going to carry this out. Uh, can we use genetic engineering? No. And we went over this in class. On the board. In glowing detail. Okay, what's your answer? What? We have exactly one minute. Okay, so the first steps are the same. So you would be crossing um, a non-resistant. Sensitive and resistant variety. Yeah, Okay. one sensitive, one resistant as the parents. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get little and seedling. Yeah, and then we can. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we can make a, 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 a pundit, pundit score. Okay, guys, you have about one okay, minute okay. to give me a good answer. Okay, um, what, you can make a pundit score, right? Yeah, so you get one sensitive and one resistant, so you're going to get 
middle X, middle X. We'll assume that the other that they're both homozygous. So big X, big X. You know X. about how many genes are involved in this process? Well, we assume that there's one from both parents. Mm -hmm. So. So how are you going to do this? So then you end up with both parents having becoming heterozygous. So therefore, just through basic ideology, you're going to get that all the seedlings from from crossing a sensitive variety and a resistant variety are going to be heterozygous for this variety. Mm -hmm. So, but because it's because this is a recessive trait, it's not going to be expressed yet. So therefore, we have to continue to crossbreed, and we can assume from then that. How are you going to carry this breeding program out using molecular tools that have nothing to do with genetic engineering, have nothing to do with um, agrobacterium, have nothing to do with particle guns, have nothing to do with just assuming and breeding and praying and hoping. How are you going to do this using many of the procedures which you are so familiar with? And if I put in a different context, you would recognize instantaneously. How will you carry this out? I'm not sure. Would Tiger. I can't, I don't hear you, you have a, no genetic engineering. You have a Phytophthora resistant gene in a clone. That's what you have. You can't sequence? No sequencing of the genome, no. Uh, I'm surprised because we, I asked you the exact same question in class. We discussed it and outline the exact same answer to this question in class. And I said that that question would be on your final oral exam. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. If you have the gene in a clone, can you just? Are you going to give me the experiment, or are you going to ask a question? I guess I'm not going to say anything. OK. <laughs> Chris? Uh, hmm. Okay, um, so you have the resistant strain and the non-resistant strain. You crossbreed them, and you could uh, Eden. Could you do selective breeding like a dog? Samantha. I don't know if I can't use genetic Brian? engineering. Am I allowed to use PCR? You could. Okay. <laughs> then, I, then I would breed the resistant and the non-resistant. Mm -hmm. I would grow the seeds. I would take a leaf off of the plants that grow mm -hmm. and isolate the DNA. And then perform PCR for the gene. For which gene? For the resistant gene. How are you going to distinguish the resistant versus the sensitive? Oh, I have the clone. You have the resistant clone. The resistant clone, right. How are you going to distinguish the resistant versus the sensitive? Ben? Using if you have a probe for the resistant, it won't bind to the sensitive because they're different. There's um, genetic differences between them. Let's just assume they're allelic. Well, two different and that was the hypothesis here. Well, two different alleles have different Can different I, different alleles have different nucleotide sequences. That's why that's why they are different because there's different nucleotide sequences. How many differences between alleles? There's just one, or there doesn't have. To. So tell me how you're going to do this experiment. Can Elaine. I think you have to digest it first with restriction enzymes and then... How are you going to know what restriction enzymes are digested and what are you looking for? You can sequence it. Well, no. well, well you, can't you can't sequence, sequence the it. genome, but you could... All right. You could make... Go ahead. What's the concept here? Okay. Well, you want to identify the point mutation that occurred that will make a new restriction site. So what right. is the concept you're trying to distinguish here? Between what and what? So let's say the normal gene is. I don't know what the normal gene is. It's resistant and sensitive. There's no such thing as normal. The resistant gene, let's say it does not have the restriction site. And so, but 
the... How many restriction sites would be in a gene that's 10,000 base pairs in length? You can have a lot. <clears throat> so what are you trying to distinguish here? Ben, you want to take a stab again? I believe you're looking for RFOPs. Thank you. And you Between you what and what? Between the resistant and the sensitive. Yeah. You have you the resistant a clone, you can find the sensitive clone, you can find an RFLP between the two, and you can do exactly the same thing you do with pedigree analysis, and you can analyze for the presence of the resistant and the sensitive gene along the way very easily. It's no different than the pedigree we had on the board in dealing with the uh, ASOs. Great job, guys. Thank you very much. Let's go to, we have two more, so try and uh, put your concentration caps on and give everyone your unguarded attention. Let's go to question number six. The Davis group is the answer group, and the challenge group is group number C. So uh, for A, it asks the... Can I have your attention, please? Go ahead. And ask the genetic issues <clears throat> raised by the, the CPP propaganda. And we said that um, they, because they think that there's like a pure race and a or a superior race, a genetically superior race, um, based on what we know, the diversity um, in a population, in individuals, the, the difference in their genetic sequence is less than 1%. Like the difference, yeah. Yeah, pretty much all all of us in the world are the genetic material. We're ninety nine point nine similar, and so that point one is just what makes us different. So what they think that um, how they like categorize people would probably be like by phenotype, and um, we also know that the phenotypic um, what. The genes that, that make up your physical features are like a handful yeah. amount, so it's not yeah. really a and lot that like compare you. they're environmentally um, affected. So just because um, you look a certain way, it doesn't mean it's only because of your environment and where you're located. Yeah. And the second one is how would you use SNP haplotype and or whole genome sequencing analysis to demonstrate experimentally that the genetic diversity in the cent centerland population is similar to that found in non-centerland populations? And we said that you could um, compare the SNPs, bless you, you could compare the SNPs um, in g the different genomes and um, you could, or in the central line population and the non central line populations. And if you compare them, you can see that uh, most of their, um, their genetic, genetics are like the same. And then um, a SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, and um, it occurs through mutations um, when one nucleotide is um, switched out. And a haplotype is a block of, of these SNPs that are joined together over time. And a personal genome is when you um, sequence your own individual DNA. So we said that SNPs and haplotypes arise in human populations um, through mutations and um, just breeding because when a person, like when two people mate and have uh, a child, their 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 gene shuffling gene, occurs, yeah. which makes during us meiosis different, yeah. that their chromosomes like they they shuffle mm -hmm. like so then <laughs> um, it's all different. Yeah, it makes like yeah a combination of the parents. And then, um, oh, and we said that we could use the like a DNA chip to see um, to compare the SNPs and haplotypes in these uh, is more frequent in a population. And then finally, for well, not finally, but second last for part E was that um, we all of us came from um, East Africa, and as the as the first people moved, they took some diversity with them, and then as they kept moving and settling all across the world, they, the diversity um, lowered a little bit. But we each have we each can be traced back to, um, to Africa, and so therefore, um, because we have um, we all have. Pretty much, majority of our genetic makeup is similar. That point one um, does not make anyone superior or inferior. Mm -hmm. We're all equal. Challenge. So, like, okay. One more. One more. There's part. one more question. Challenge. Challenge group. They still have F. I know. 
Okay. Um, can you explain how a DNA chip works? Mm -hmm. The question is, how does a DNA chip work? Okay, so um, the DNA is taken from an individual, and then their SNPs are are um, their their SNPs are going to like probe on. Yeah. Okay. They're they're probed on, so um, it attaches on, and then to the DNA chip, and then like whatever whatever um, SNP you have, it'll like light up. It'll light up in the DNA chip, and then you'll know like which. Yeah, what whatever um, sequence you have. Challenge? Um, between, or what would be the best way for, like, comparison? Can you be more specific about that, please? Like between SNPs, haplotypes, and the whole genome. What is your question? I'm not, I, I don't understand it. Comparing. You're saying what is the best method or what? Yes. What do you think the best method is for comparing these genomes? SNPs, haplotypes, or whole genome sequencing? What, what might you get in terms of different information? Okay. So, um, SNPs is where you're looking at just like a single nucleotide chip. A haplotype is where you're looking at blocks of DNA, so looking at over time, what, like how the, the SNPs happened and what made the changes occur. Um, I think like for haplotypes, like there's the blocks of SNPs that usually get inherited together, so then you can um, trace where people come from, come from. Um, based on that because... Um, if it gets inherited as a like a block, then you're more likely to have come from like a certain origin. And it, you, and it carries on throughout your ancestry as well too. Challenge. Is that what you're so, um, in what cellular pro cellular process do SNPs arise? Like, how how do they come about? Like, in what process? Mutations. Yeah, like the SNPs. Like, how how would they get into the gen the genetic code? Like, what process? Um, How do SNPs um, arise? Kind of like in I the actual genome. Mutations. Mutations. Like how would you get a mutation in the gene? Uh, oh, oh, like if you're um, during like trans. Trans. Translation. 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 And. And the mutation like it arises during like translation? translation? When does the mutation occur? When they're reading it, when they're reading it. Okay, you say? Uh, just, uh, transcription? When they're. How when would it be inherited if the mutation occurred during transcription? Oh, oh dear mass. Oh. Challenge? Um, you mentioned um, subpopulations and migration. How yeah. do these um, how do these relate, and what is um, what kind of things would you see because of those? So, if since we all came from Africa, and then that certain group, like like people from there, moved, and um, they took a little bit of diversity, and then once that those people from that area kept moving and moving. <laughs> The, they took less and less. Back. Yeah, they took less and less back, so the there's lower diversity. So then you can trace people like where they're from and like where they went from, um, and who they made with, yeah. and to figure out where they went to. Challenge. What is meant by the term genetic diversity? Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, it's just um, some genetic diversity would be how. How diverse, <laughs> diverse your. What does that mean in genetic the, terms? The fact that when when you when you move from populations and you made it with different people from different populations um, through the gene shuffling, it created more diversity. Tell me population. what what's genetic diversity meant in terms that we've used in class a million times, like purple cabbage and green cabbage. Oh, like, allelic frequency, alle alleles. Yeah. How many different? How much of alleles? Great. Challenge from anyone. 
John, do you have any questions? can't see you. I know. I've got to focus on them. So um, how do you discover SNPs? How do you discover, or like during sequence, well, you can sequence and like see, is what, that like What would you sequence to discover SNPs? Sequence. The non, non the coding region of your DNA. Okay, but what would you... You're, you're, so you're sequencing all the non-coding regions, or what are you what are you well, comparing? If you know where it's located in the genome, then then you can like compare like uh, which nucleotide was changed. Changed between what though? Between the individuals. Okay. Yeah. So individuals. What do you mean by individuals? Like. Like like a certain area in your in your genome would be or like in your sequence like it will be different and if you're like in Africa or something and when you're in um, yeah. Europe. Okay. Yeah. Ryan, do you have a challenge? Mm. Mm. Oh, look at the time! <laughs> Only 15 minutes left. So you said that every population that engages in a migration has a subset of the original population's yeah. diversity. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you ever see, okay, um, do you only ever see a reduction in, a, in the diversity of alleles as populations migrate? No, be, well, not really. If because, you, oh, because if you like mate with like people who like also migrated out, then you could have had like more and you, then you could have had uh, more diversity as well. Let me refine the question. A population in North America, their allelic diversity, would it only be a subset of the diversity found in Africa? Yes. yes. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Let's do last uh, but not least. Last but not least, we have question number, I believe, five. And for question number five, we have group F as the answer group. And we have uh, group number D as the challenge group. OK, last question. Let's have your undivided attention, please. Okay, I'm going to take a, um, and the T and F, or um, the tumor necrosis factor mRNA, and use reverse transcriptase to create cDNA, then DNA polymerase to create a double-stranded cDNA. And then what I'm going to do is remove the gag pole and N region of the um, retrovirus, and then insert um, the double-stranded mRNA, the cloned <coughs> double-stranded cDNA into that region, into the region between the packaging sequence. The, the gap, basically, we just um, described, or just described, and then also um, insert after the packaging sequence, but not in the mRNA gene, that, or not the cDNA gene, um, uh, neomyosin resistance. And then um, I'm going to place that sequence into, um, or that recombined DNA um, into a helper cell. And then um, in the helper cell, it has the um, gag pole and N region, but it does not have the packaging sequence, or yeah, it does not have the package, psi, I'm sorry, psi sequence. And the um, psi, and then that the helper cell will create the virus with the therapeutic protein, and then will, um, after removing the somatic cells, which are the bone marrow cells, going to infect those cells with the, um, the recombined um, retrovirus, and then um, insert those cells into the body. Okay. So the procedure that we did in part A that was ex vivo because we took the somatic cells out of the body and then uh, introduced our uh, recombined virus which infected the cells and then we reintroduced the cells into the body for, that, for it to um, take them in. In vivo would be if we had just introduced our virus directly into someone's body and hoped that it was picked up in the right places in the right cells. Uh, we could use protein-specific membrane or Right, protein-specific membrane 
um, viruses that would bind to the right cells but wouldn't necessarily insert the DNA into the right part of the cell. <clears throat> okay, problems, um, ethical issues that, can, that need to be considered prior to carry out the somatic cell gene therapy. So first of all, during um, this part where humans are actually taking out the gag pole and arm parts and putting them in the packaging cells, there could be um, small problems, whether or not maybe we introduce the psi, the packaging part of the genome into the actual helper cell, that could be a problem. Um, also, we don't necessarily know where we're going to put the genetic, um, the, what is it? <coughs> the genetic construct inside the actual um, genome. We Are don't know. Are these scientific issues or ethical issues? Scientific and ethical. How about ethical issues? Okay, ethical issues. Um, in regards to, I think there were 11 babies born with skids and we introduced them with uh, gene therapy and about two years later, um, two of the, two or three of the children actually developed leukemia after this therapy. So there's the problem that we don't necessarily know um, if humans are going, if humans are going to accept this kind of therapy, and there's also other problems that could evolve out of it. Um, I, I only have scientific. Yeah, keep going. Also, it's not permanent, so um, I mean that is scientific, but also ethical because you don't want to have to like keep injecting these pe children with drugs. And then outline how these engineered stem cells, oh, so we're talking about stem cells here. So um, stem cells are pluripotent, so we could um, possibly uh, differentiate that stem cell into maybe whole organs or maybe like a tissue, and then we can apply that to the patient to, with cancer or disorders. Um, these stem cells, we could differentiate them and we can also like apply a certain drug if we're trying to like, if, you're, if we're trying to do clinical trials or like, something we wouldn't, like before we would try it on humans, we could try it on the organs that got, you could differentiate. And then the ethical issues would be that um, since we're using embryos to create, uh, get, get these stem, cell, stem cells, um, some people might say that embryos are potential human beings and you're destroying them. <coughs> um, we could say that like we need donors, we need egg donors in order for t to, to, to create embryos. In order to create these stem cells, we need like, uh, we need eggs, so people may say it's devaluing life to, you know, get out to get these eggs from women. Um, there could be eugenics, eugenic, like trying to make things better, like better eggs, I guess. And then whether engineering did. Oh, so therapeutic clones would uh, offer an advantage because if we know how to differentiate it into these tissues, specialized tissues or organs, we could, uh, it's more controlled. We know where we're putting, well, we don't we don't need to worry about like what retroviruses like we have a problem of you know we don't know where it's going to be integrated in the host cell or like specificity so challenge also we could use challenge. them everywhere such as brain cells um what would be the results of if, if the gene were to uh disrupt an oncogene or a tumor suppressor it could potentially cause cancer um, with an oncogene, it would only take kind of one hit, and that's it. Like, if it came in uh, and it disrupted the oncogene, then you would have cancer immediately. Um, it, or if it was a tumor suppressing gene, you would have to actually mess up both tumor suppressor, both alleles of the tumor suppressing gene, and then you would get cancer. Challenge. So, how would you describe these proto oncogenes and um, tumor suppressor genes in terms of dominant and recessive traits? Does this have to do with this question, per se? Kind of, because it has to do with cancer. Does this have to do with cancer, or does it have to do with challenging them on their answer? Okay. <laughs> Can you tell me what some of the general properties of cancer are, and um, what, why does it make uh, cancer bad? Like, Is that a challenge to their answer? So you mentioned using, creating patient-specific stem cell lines. So how could you create, for example, a, a patient-specific stem cell line for me using a donor egg? Oh, so using a donor egg, you could, you could take, it to, take, the, take its nucleus out. Um, you would get, we could get like a skin cell from you or a cheek swab and t take out your <laughs> DNA and then do nuclear transfer to get this, um, I guess. 
or with the donor egg, and then and then you would um, put it on culture with growth factors, and then make a, an embryo. Well, well, you would grow it until you get a blastocyst and take its inner cell mass to get your own stem cells. Challenge: What does pluripotency mean in relation to stem cells? They're undifferentiated, um, so that means that they can, all the cells are, um, or all the DNA, the switches aren't on or off yet. Um, basically, every gene can be expressed. But it's not complete, totipotent. The difference between pluripotent in regards to um, like embryos and stem cells is on the outside, um, because it's pluripotent, because on the inside it's only pluripotent, we can't actually produce the amniotic sac and um, the placenta. That's why it's not completely totipotent. Challenge? Oh, okay. Uh, what are the gag pull and on responsible for? Okay. The gag um, it is for the um, cap or capsid. The pole is for reverse transcription rate, and N is for the um, membrane proteins. Envelope, yeah. Could you tell me some of the ethical issues dealing with this, please? Ethical issues? Ethical. Well, it, um... I'm assuming that if you're carrying out this science, you can sequence where the DNAs go into the genome of these things. You'll know where it is. You'll know that it's in a leukemia gene or not. You're not going to have any mysteries here. What are the ethical issues? Scientific issues are the easy ones. You're manipul... <clears throat> well, like I was talking about earlier, you don't necessarily know exactly where the um, gene might be placed in the genome. And well, tell me how you would do that, Samantha, because you do know that. So describe an experiment to show how the gene is in the exact place of the human genome. You know the sequence of the gene. Nothing that you don't know. Tell me how you would do that. Wouldn't you just sequence it and see Sequence if what? You could do colony hybridization. Colony hybridization. How are you going to know what gene your therapeutic DNA went into in this bone marrow culture or this cell culture? How would you know exactly what gene it goes into? If it went into a gene, the gene would be knocked out, but um, that's one of the biggest problems. How could with you use molecular tools to know exactly what gene it would go into? I'm assuming that you know the sequence of the human genome. I'm assuming that you know the sequence of your therapeutic clone and the gene that you're engineering. There's really nothing that you don't know. So how would you know where this goes, Brian, in the human genome? Brian. You would sequence the whole genome and see you're where it is. That would be an awful big job if you're going to be doing it on all these different steps. Why not? Let's say you don't have a sequencing machine. You could also test to make sure it produces the protein. Give me one minute, Ingrid. How about just using the polymerase chain reaction That'll and work trying too. to find out what things are next to it by you know, shooting the polymerase out this way and shooting it out that way using primers in the gene, extending them, getting the products and sequencing and finding out what's flanking the gene. Be an easy way to do it. Thanks a lot, guys. Great job. What's so funny, Harumi? Are you ecstatic? Are you ecstatic? God, can you believe this is over with? What do you think, Chris? What do you think? Pardon? It's never over. So can we see John on there and the rest of you guys? Can you? Yeah, perfect. And Ryan, perfect. OK. Ingrid, can you bring that thing in, please? Just in the box. It's always surprises in this class. Always, always surprises. Thank you, Ingrid. John, are you there? We're here, Bob. Great. 
All of you have done a very, very, very nice job. I know how much work it was. And so uh, before we uh, say sayonara, or I should say I say sayonara to you, uh, there's a few traditions, uh, Goldberg traditions, that we need to complete before uh, the end of this quarter. And so one of them will be shown in a uh, project uh, that we always do in this class. And provided I can get my lights off, and provided that I can get my DVD on, there's always surprises in my class. You guys should know that. OK. Still not over yet. Almost, but not quite. Daisy, where is Daisy? Can I have your help, please? And Aicha, maybe? So I have a tradition in my classes that, other than a project like this, um, I always uh, have something made in honor of the class that has something to do with some scientific aspect of this class. Um, and some of you may or may not know about this fancy bakery in Westwood called Paris Pastry, which they have some amazing artists that can do some remarkable stuff uh, with um, pastry. In any case, uh, I'd like to uh, award this piece of art to all of you. We just lift it up here. And it says, I survived HC70A and SAS70A, winter 2009, with professors Bob Goldberg and John Harada. And you'll notice that that was one of the first figures from your Scientific American articles that you didn't think that you'd ever understand what it meant. Uh, but it's clear that you really quite understand what it is now. And so we're going to take this uh, outside for a minute. Uh, and you'll have access to it in a couple of seconds. And then, um, because I know that you can't simply, oh, look at that. Look at the Davis screen, Bob. <laughs> Wonderful. Because I know, just a sec, because I know, thank you, because I know that you can't just eat the cake. When you leave here, after you do some of the paperwork that you have to do for me, and a survey that I'd like you to do, which you filled out the first day of class, but I'm interested in knowing what you think the last day of class. Um, then dinner will be served outside as the final reception for all of you to end the class. John, do you have anything you want to say? No, just that it's been a wonderful experience working uh, with UCLA and Davis. I thought it worked very well. And thanks a lot for all your hard work on the course, Bob. Thank you, John. Ingrid, do you have something? Ingrid, can I? I'm not done yet. Do you want to lecture? Are you? I'm, can you step out, please? Thank you. So been a long journey, huh? Told you guys in the beginning of class that you'd probably have one of the most unique experiences that you'll ever have in the classroom. And I hope that, uh, that I've uh, proved that to be correct. I know from my standpoint, I had a absolutely uh, fabulous time this quarter. Um, I hope you can see that because it's just been so much fun for me doing what I love to do the most, which is teaching all of you. Uh, and I must say that uh, as with everything that I do, I gave it, you know, 5,000% of my time. And I hope that you found that it was uh, a worthwhile endeavor. And I hope that you walk out of here not only with uh, a knowledge of science and a new way of thinking and a new way of really critically thinking, uh, but I hope you walk out of here with a greater sense of yourself. 
And so it's really important for me to, to end this class by saying to you, uh, because this will be the last time I'll be in front of all of you, that I think it's absolutely very important for all of you as you embark and move forward, uh, just as I've done in my life and John Harada has done, is to always climb high mountains. And that's what I think we've done in this class. You've climbed a mountain which was much higher than you would ever imagine. And so I think that climbing those mountains is really important because I think in your life, what you want to do is you want to have a vision and you want to get there. And you want to have a vision that's unique. And you don't want to settle for something that's just so-so. You want to shoot for the sky, climb high mountains, always be moving forward, never looking backwards, and finally, never, ever, ever do anything less than excellence. That's the most important thing. I think in this class, many of you learned that you were capable of doing a hell of a lot more than you ever thought that you could possibly do. That's just the beginning. Your job is to go out into the world and do all of those things, not for tomorrow or the next day, or the time after that, but you're the ones that really have to go out and provide the visions and the dreams and make all those visions and those dreams become a reality. And so all I can say is in uh, passing that no class like this uh, can be done without the help of a tremendous number of people in the background. You've had three phenomenal teaching assistants one of which is uh, one of your own peers, an undergraduate, Daisy, and I think that you can understand how much work those discussions were and how much they really cared and did a tremendous job for all of you in a different way of teaching a discussion. Uh, the guys over here who really were doing the commuter, computer connections and making all of these things possible, we couldn't have done this class without your tremendous help. Uh, we certainly couldn't have done this class without uh, Min and Chen, technicians in my lab, doing all the PCR and helping me with my PowerPoints and all those things. And uh, we couldn't have done it without Ingrid uh, in the background, you know, doing all of the organizing and everything else. But the final thing is that we couldn't have done this class without you because it is a radical approach to teaching. And so from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thanks to all of you for making this a great experience. Good luck to all of you. Thank you. Do the administrative stuff that Ingrid has for you, and then we'll all join out in the patio for dinner and the cake. Thank you very much.